Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, is there any question before we start? No? Okay, so um, with last session, we uh, covered uh, convolution, uh, sorry, uh, generative adversarial network or GAN. Uh, it's fundamentals. Now let's go into the uh, networks that uh, have implemented GAN. So one of the very initial networks which did that was Deep Convolutional GAN or DC GAN. Okay. So uh, Deep Convolutional GAN or DC GAN, it was proposed in 2016 and it made GAN deeper. So it, it came after the original GAN. It made GAN deeper and also generated higher resolution uh, images than GAN. Okay. Uh, it also showed that it is very hard to train a GAN. So they found out that it's very hard actually to train a GAN and this paper showed that. And uh, we use, a, and for DC GAN, what do we do? What uh, we use at all convolutional network. What does it mean? There is no uh, fully connected layer. Also, it replaces the pooling functions with the strided convolutions. So even doesn't have pooling. The pooling has been replaced by uh, strided convolutions. And also the network learns its own spatial downsampling, right? So, right, because pooling was used for downsampling. Now that we don't, uh, we don't, uh, use pooling, the network itself learns how to downsample using the convolutions. And the network is used for both uh, generator and discriminator. So for we have two networks, right? One for generator and one for discriminator. And we use uh, the uh, one network with the same uh, settings, one network for generator and one network for discriminator. In this again, we also have uh, only convolutional layers in the input layer of generator and output layer of discriminator without any fully connected layer. You understand? So there is no fully connected layer. All of the layers are convolutional layers. And why do I say input layer of generator? Because usually input layer, output layer of generator, we know is it is what? When, what the data set is image, okay, here. We know that when the data set is image, the output layer of generators must be convolutional. So in original GAN, the input layer of generator used to be fully connected because it gets it gets the noise, right? But it says uh, let its input layer of generator also be convolutional. Also in original GAN, we know that the, the input layer of discriminator should also be must be convolutional because it accepts the image as input, right? Uh, but in uh, DC GAN, we say the output layer of discriminator, let it be convolutional also. Okay. This elimination of fully connected layers is inspired by this reference 24. Okay. In DC GAN, what do we do? We also apply batch normalization. What is batch normalization? Do you remember? Recall the previous sessions that we had. We have it, had it a lot in different networks. The batch normalization standardizes uh, the output of each layer. So uh, its mean becomes zero and it the, the mean of batch becomes zero at that layer. Also, uh, uh, the variance of it becomes one, right? To all layers except the last layer of generator and the first layer of discriminator, why? Why don't we use batch normalization in the last layer of generator? Because the last layer of generator should generate the image, right? If you apply batch normalization, then the, um, the mean and variance of image will be ruined, right? You need to generate the, the statistics of the image. Therefore, in the last layer of generator, you need you shouldn't apply batch normalization. Also in the first layer of discriminator, you shouldn't do batch normalization. Why? Because the first layer of discriminator gets the image. So you need to accept the statistics of image 
uh, for finding out whether it's real or fake, right? Uh, yeah, we all, I have said that. And batch normalization reduces the problem of mode collapse. We will explain what uh, uh, mode, the problem of mode collapse. This is the biggest problem with GANs, mode collapse. We will talk about it uh, with the price of what? Because everything, uh, we always have trade-off in machine learning. With a, with, uh, we must pay some price, what? With the price of causing some fluctuations and instability, right? Uh, adding batch normalization resolves the problem of mode collapse, but it adds oscillation, fluctuation. Uh, virtual batch normalization, you can see this reference. What is that? Batch normalization has a problem. It makes the effect of every the effect of every input x on the network dependent on other inputs in the mini batch, right? Because we use the statistics of the whole mini batch, right? Do you agree? So in batch normalization, there is a problem, and that we use the statistics statistics of the whole batch for making the mean of batch zero and the variance of batch one, but it says. So for, every, for the effect of every input, you are dependent on other inputs. To not have this problem, virtual batch normalization or VBN, what does it do? It fixes the mini batches initially once before the start of the training. Okay, so we don't change the mini batches during training. These mini batches are called the reference batches. And every reference batch is normalized by only its own statistics. Because previously in batch normalization, we at every epoch we're shuffling, right? Sometimes uh, one point uh, will be in one of the batches, sometimes in another epoch it will be in another batch. But let's fix them. Let's fix them before a start of training, and that's called virtual batch normalization. VBN has been found to be effective in the training of generator. Okay. In the training of generator, it has been found useful. So in, uh, yes. Okay, in DC GAN, the last layer of generator has the hyperbolic tangent activation function. So they, uh, is, why do they do that? Because the last layer generator generates the data, right? The fake data or generated data. It, then you need to choose the activation function of the last layer of generator is uh, according to your data. For example, your data might be what? Assume your data, there is no bound on your data. Then the activation, Fashion should be linear or no activation function at the last layer of generator, right? Because there is no bound. If it is between zero and one, you can use sigmoid. If it is between minus one and one, you can use hyperbolic tangent, right? So they use hyperbolic tangent because you can generate between minus one and one. Apparently they have all, after that they have uh, multiplied it by two. No, they have added uh, by two. Added one, so it is between minus one and one. They have added one, so it becomes between two and zero. And then they divide it by two to become between zero and one, which is the intensity of pixels, right? They can do that. And as in GAN, the one, oh, by the way, for the other layers, they have used ReLU activation function because it has been found to be very effective, right? Uh, usually, the default activation function in the middle layers of the neural network is ReLU. As in GAN, the one to last layer of discriminator is flattened, okay, and connected to one neuron with the sigmoid activation function. Why? Because the last layer of discriminator should decide, should be used for classification, whether it's fake or real, right? And as we always have ta talked about, we can see class, uh, classification as a special case of regression. So you output a probability between zero and one, and then using a threshold, maybe half, you can find out whether it's fake or real. So you use a sigmoid activation function, which outputs between zero and one, right? 
In contrast to GAN, original GAN or vanilla GAN, which uses a max out activation function for discriminator layers, this again uses the leaky uh, rectified active uh, action, uh, activation function for discriminator. What does it mean? Leaky relu. Do you remember leaky relu was leaky relu uh, was sorry is uh, it was like this. Why do we use leaky relu rather than relu? We talked about it before. Because if we use relu, it becomes too sparse, right? Uh, we want to give chance to negative values a bit. And therefore, we use leaky, leaky relu. They have found that it is useful. This again showed that we can generate images from a specific domain, right? We have domain, for example, here, if you are training on GAN on the facial images, the domain is the facial images, right? So you have some domains. Generate images from a specific domain. If we train GAN on that domain, we can do that. Okay. For example, an example, they uh, generated bedroom images. So they had a, they had a sort of bedroom images with different bedrooms and they trained DC GAN on that and they could generate different bedroom images which doesn't, which don't exist in the world. It's interesting. They generated some bedroom images with some beds and curtains and this is, but this image, this scene doesn't exist in the world. Okay, interesting. And this again also showed that the learned latent space is meaningful and we can do vector arithmetic in the latent space. Very interesting, very interesting. I think they were inspired by what? By which method? I think I talked about it when I was talking about, you remember, attention mechanism transformers. Uh, I talked about it a bit. We have work to vec work to vec embedding. Uh, it was in natural language processing before appearance of transformers. We had work to vec and glove. For, for advertising work to vec what did the author do? They said, let's have, this is what they had. They said, we have assume king, the embedding for the word, uh, word king. Assume you, you have, in word two vec, you have an embedding vector per word in the dictionary, okay? So you have an embedding vector for king. You also have uh, an embedding vector for man. You have an embedding vector for woman. So king minus man plus woman, I mean the vector of king minus the vector of man plus the vector of woman becomes almost equal to the vector of queen. It's very interesting. So you can do vector arithmetic in the world of natural language process, right? Inspired by them, people said when GAN came, they said, why not? Let's use vector arithmetic in the world of images. Uh, and I will tell you, it, it's not like just you have images and you subtract the images. It's not like that. We'll see. So what do we do? So as I said, it's inspired by what war to vec. And uh, it made it possible to do vector arithmetic in the latent space for images. So here, as uh, war to vec applies uh, vector uh, arithmetic, in the embedding space, right? In the embedding space of war to vec, right? Because you can't say king minus man. It, it is the embedding of king minus the embedding of man, right? Here also, we do vector arithmetic in the latent space of yeah, right? What do I mean by latent space? Z, the noise Z that we feed to the generator, do you remember? We will have a vector Z Pair generation, right? You take, you give me some noise, I will generate some image corresponding to that noise, right? You give me another Z, I give it, I generate another image, right? By the generator. So we have corresponding uh, latent vectors for different uh, generations. There, then we can, as the corresponding noises are the corresponding 
vectors and latent vectors, we can do vector arithmetic on them. So an example of vector arithmetic by DC GAN is shown in this figure. You can see it's very interesting. So we have man with glasses here, minus man without glasses, plus woman without glasses. It becomes woman with glasses. And how did they do that? Let me tell you. First off, I think it's obvious. The man with, with glasses minus man without glasses, it means remove the gender man, right? Am I right? Remove the gender man, but the glasses will remain. Then plus woman without glasses. So we, woman without glasses means only the gender woman. So he, until here, we have here until here until one stage one we have man and glasses in stage two we have glasses only without the gender here in stage three we have woman with uh, with the uh, eyeglasses therefore as expected we should have woman with eyeglasses and how did they do that you can get a latent uh, because by uh, by traversing in the manifold of the latent space right do you remember in variation of auto encoder we did that we did that we traversed in the latent space of the uh, variation of auto encoder and we saw what what are they uh, generating right so he, or, likewise we can traverse in the latent space in the uh, latent space of generator of uh, gan and we can see, for example, this, we can find out which region is generating facial images of man with glasses. So we can find out, okay, this region is generating facial images of man, men with different glasses, right? Eyeglasses. So I take a latent vector from that region. Then also I found out which region of the latent space is generating only men without glasses. So also take one latent vector from there. Also, I get, I find out a region which is generating images of women, female images without eyeglasses also have that. So I do uh, vector arithmetic between them and it gives me one Z, right? So I have Z1 for this, I find it where it is. I have Z2, I have Z3 also, do you agree? I have three Z vectors. So I can say Z1 minus Z2 plus Z3. It gives me some Z. Maybe I call it Z4, okay? Then I feed Z4 to the generator. Do you agree that it should generate something? It should generate something. As expected, it generates woman with eyeglasses. Interesting. However, it's not that much stable. This They did it. They coded that. They did it that it's not that much stable. For this to become stable, rather than one Z1, they had an average of three Z1s. What do I mean? I have a region. I know that this region generates men with glasses. So I take three Zs in that, from that region, and then I use the average of these three as Z1. Do you agree? The average, so this has Z1, 1, Maybe this has Z1, 2, this has Z1, 3. These are three vectors. The average gives me Z1. Also, I have Z2, 1, Z2, 2, Z2, 3. The average gives me Z2. Also, these have the Zs. The average gives me Z3. And here, you can see the images generated by Z1 and Z2 and Z3. Right? Here also, Z4. It, generate, it gives me Z4. And why do we have several of them? Because as I said, Z4, when you feed it to the generator, it generates something, right? However, uh, it, it is a stochastic. If you move a bit from Z4 in the latent space, you can generate different things. So they have moved a bit and they have found out that these are, and interestingly, with small variation in the latent space, they are all uh, facial images of women without the eyeglasses. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. And it can become more interesting how you can weight them. 
in the vector arithmetic. So rather than saying Z1 minus Z2 plus Z3, weight them in a way that maybe, how should I say? You can have a weighted linear com combination. And by changing the weights, you change the effect, you see the, the effect of change in the output gener uh, generation. What do I mean? For example, uh, assume I have some Z for, assume I have Z of man without eyeglasses and also, so alpha Z man plus one minus alpha because I want the summation to be one, the summation of weights, Z glasses. So assume I have this alpha Z man plus one minus alpha Z of glasses. What happens and sweep alpha from zero to one. When alpha is zero, you will get mostly on, on, only eyeglasses. When alpha is one, you will get only man without eyeglasses. But when you sweep alpha from zero toward one, you will see the eyeglasses are appearing on the face and the eyes. Of it. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. So you can do it. Like. I have a question. Uh, is there some possibility that the model become biased? Because in the example we have like men and women, but they are like you know, specific uh, ethnicities. Yes, yes, exactly. So can we make the model more general in order to try to become more, to see part passing the, the ethnicity? Yeah, the exactly. Person. So the question for this to be recorded is that uh, maybe the model becomes biased. Here, for example, it has been biased on the uh, white ethnicity. So how can we uh, make it more general? As I said, GAN uh, generates from uh, images from a specific domain that you train on. Okay. Then you can include uh, images from other ethnicities. Then it will learn how to generate the images from the different ethnicities. And interestingly, when you include them, then the latent space in, is learned in a way that some region generates black images, black faces. Some region generates Asian ethnicity. Some regions generate white. So you can move for, from, from one ethnicity to another one. It's very interesting. And you can generate some image which is similar to, to be a child of different two different ethnicities. <laughs> so you can, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Okay. So, uh, mode collapse problem in GAN. This is the biggest problem in GAN. Let's see. So we expect, what do we do? We expect from GAN to learn a meaningful latent space of Z or yeah, the Z, which was the noise or latent space that every specific value of Z maps to a specific generated data point X. This is exactly what we want. Every Z gives me some X, right? Also, nearby Z values in the latent space should be mapped to a similar but a little different generation. What do I mean? I have some Z. It gives me some X, right? Generates some X. I tweak Z a bit. The generation, generation should not differ a lot, right? Because I modified Z a little bit. Therefore, X should be also modified a little bit, the generated X. This is what we expect from GAN. The mode collapse problem, also known as the Helvetica, Helvetica scenario, if I pronounce it correctly, Helveti, Helvetica, I think, Helvetica scenario, is a common problem in GAN models. What does it do? It refers to when the generator cannot learn a perfectly meaningful latent space, as what we explained. Rather, it learns to map several different Z values to the same generated data point. It's very weird. What do I mean? When mode collapse happens, assume this is late in the space, assume. You have some Z, it generates some X, right? Generates some X. You have some Z from another part of the latent space that also maps to X. It means that this is not semantic, right? Because the Zs are very different, but they are generating the same X almost. So they map several different Z values to the same generated data point. Mode collapse usually happens in GAN 
when the distribution of training data or P data X has multiple modes. When you have multiple modes in your domain, assume your domain of data set is multivariate, is a, a mixture of Gaussians, I mean, assume. Then you have uh, multiple modes and the GAN gets confused how to generate the modes, which mode it should generate, right? An example of mode collapse is illustrated in this figure. We have, this is the data. So it's mixture of how many Gaussians? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight Gaussians, right? If you zoom to each of these points, it becomes like a Gaussian distribution. Do you get what I mean? So it's, I'm far away from, I'm looking far away from uh, uh, these distributions. If I zoom, for example, this becomes like this, okay? So here we have a mixture of Gaussians. Then in different training steps, step zero, for example, epoch or step, step 5,000, step 10,000, step 15,000, you will see that we have some specific region of Z. Once it generates this, for example, then it generates another mode. Then it generates another mode. It cannot generate the whole mixture. Always it learns to, in, and in every specific epoch, it generates one of the modes. Then you train more, it generates another mode. It forgets the previous mode. <laughs> okay, so that, that's a problem. This maps all Z values to one of the modes of mixture. Okay. When the discriminator learns to reject generation of some mode, the generator learns to map all Z values to another mode. So this is the reason that mode collapse is happening here. They discriminate because they are competing, right? The discriminator and the generator. The discriminator, so the generator learns to generate some mode. The discriminator finds out and the generator can't fool the discriminated by generator realistic data. Therefore, rather than trying harder to generate better data, it, try, it says, oh, there is a, an easier way to fool the discriminator. Let's go and generate another mode, okay? Because the discriminator has been biased to find out whether it's fake or real for this mode, then the generator moves to another mode to fool the discriminator in, a, in an easier way. It never learns to generate all modes of the mixture. Okay, that's a problem. We expect GAN to map some parts and not all parts of the latent space to one of the modes, right? This is what we want. Each region of the Z latent space should generate some one of the modes. Okay. Another statement of the mode collapse is this as follows. You can see there's this reference. Assume P data X is multimodal while the latent space PZ has only one mode. So if P data is multimodal, then and the latent space is one has one mode. Then consider two points X1 and X2 from two modes of the data because our data is multimodal, right? X1 is from one of the modes, X2 is from another mode whose corresponding latent noises are Z1 and Z2 because each X has some corresponding latent variable, right? So uh, X1 and, A and X2, let them have the corresponding latent noises as Z1 and Z2. According to the mean value theorem, it's a theorem, there is a latent noise with the absolute gradient value this. So what do I mean? L2 norm of X2 minus X1 over it's a fraction over L2 norm of Z2 minus Z1. Uh, this can be any norm, for, such as L2 norm. Okay, as this gradient is Lipschitz continuous, we already talked about Lipschitz continuity, recall the, uh, the lecture of uh, back prop uh, propagation. When two modes are very far, the, the two modes of X1 and X2, when they are very far, resulting in a very large 
norm of x2 minus x1, what do I mean? When x2 and x1, the two modes are very far away, as x2 and x1 are from those two modes, the numerator of this fraction becomes very large, right? Then we face a problem. In this case, the latent noises between z1 and z2 generate data points between x1 and x2, which are not in the modes of data and thus are not valid. What do I mean? So when the, it's another, uh, another explanation of mode collapse, okay? Another interpretation of mode collapse. So when we have two mo very far away modes of the data, then the Zs learn to generate some images from, uh, generate some images which are not in either of these modes because we want to generate the data similar to the distribution of data, right? They should be generated from these modes, but sometimes we generate from other modes. And that's, that makes it a uh, problem. Why is it saying that when the two modes are very far away? Because when the two modes are close to each other, it, you can see it as one mode. Then you can see it as almost one mode and you will not have a problem of mode collapse problem. The mode collapse problem especially happens when you have multimodal data, okay? There exist various methods which resolve the mode collapse problem. I can say most of the networks or GAN var variants which were proposed, they tried to resolve the problem of mode collapse. That's why we had a lot of different uh, old, uh, papers on GAN. So they had two, uh, two things in mind or two uh, th desired goals. One of them was resolving the problem of mode collapse. The other one was generating higher resolution images, but they are related to each other. When you have mode collapse problem, we can't generate good images also. Okay, the, there exist various methods, as I said, to uh, resolve the problem of mode collapse. Uh, some of them make the latent space a mixture distribution. I think one of the simplest, thing which comes to your mind for resolving this issue is that let's make the latent space also a mixture distribution similar to the fact that we have mixture distribution in the data distribution, right? We, in the data distribution, we have a mixture distribution. Why not have a mixture distribution in the latent space? To imitate generation of the multimodal training data. Some of them, however, have other approaches. The, these methods are these, some of these methods. Mini batch GAN proposed in 2016, unrolled GAN proposed in 2017, bar, bar GAN, GAN proposed in 2018, mixture GAN or M GAN proposed in 2018, dual discriminator GAN proposed or D2 GAN proposed in 2017, Wassertain GAN or W GAN proposed in 2017. All of them have been proposed for resolving the problem of the uh, mode collapse problem. For more information on these, you can see our tutorial on GAN. It's generated adversarial networks, I think, and their variants, tutorial and survey. I can't explain all of them here, but I have explained them thoroughly in the, in the tutorial paper. For more information, you can see them. Uh, I'm trying to explain the most important things of GAN here in this lecture. Okay, some applications of GAN. Let's see some cool things like this. For example, an, an application is this. One of the applications is this. So we have image to image translation. One of the applications is this. You have some image, it translates it to another image. How? For example, we can have a coloring a sketch. You give me a sketch. I color it for you because I can generate images, right? There, so they have modified GAN in a way that it, it gets, in addition to the latent variable, it gets the sketch as input. So you can modify the neural network. They have modified that. So they get the sketch, they color it. Of course, when they were training that, they had pairs of images in the training data set. They have pair of images, pairs of images with a sketch and color, colored image. Of course, one way to generate such a data set is what? You get a data set of Im images, then you apply edge detection on them. When you apply edge detection on them, it gives you a sketches almost, right? 
<laughs> because it's as sketches are almost the edges and also that's related that's re related to computer vision and image processing uh, the most information of image is in what in edges so in in an image you have high frequency and low frequency right low frequency is what is color high frequency is the edges and corners why because assume you are an ant walking on the image, pixel by pixel. And you see the intensity of pixels. When you are in a region of the Im image where you don't have a sharp uh, difference of intensity from one pixel to another pixel, then it means that you don't see much difference, right? It's just a smooth color. So the frequency or change is low. But when you reach a boundary, an edge or a corner, then you will see a huge difference of intensity. So the change is huge, therefore the frequency is huge. Therefore edges and corners are high frequency, but the color is low frequency. And I think, you can you tell me whether high frequency is more important in image or low frequency? Of course, it depends on the application, but which one is more informative? Which one is more informative? You miss that? Guess. High frequency. High frequency is more important. Why? At least our brains work like that. When we say something, it means that in, in, uh, with respect to human, maybe so for some animals different, but for human, high frequency is more important. There is a reason. Because you can see it also in the behavior of uh, babies or ch ch children. When you we have a newborn ch child, maybe two or three year old. Then you ask them, draw something, draw a picture. How do they draw a picture of a house? Maybe they start drawing the, the edges of the house. Do they start drawing by coloring the scene? No. They first draw and then they say, okay, maybe for making it better, let's color it. Let's add some more information. But Initially, they want to put the most information in the image. That's the reason high frequency is more important in our visual system. Uh, here also, when you have some edges, you can add color if you train this in your GAN. Also, you can have, you can have a pairs of night scene and uh, daytime scene in your training data. And in the test phase now, you get a white uh, daytime scene, it generates night scene or vice versa. So you have image to image translation. Another thing is you give me an aerial image, I give you the map or vice versa, right? So you give me an aerial image, let me make it a map. I think Google Maps uses that, right? Uh, another thing is that, what, what was that? Oh, you have, Interest because in image processing, when you have color, uh, 3D channel of uh, I mean, three channels of the image RGB, you can easily make it grayscale, right? By by taking either one of the channels or an, a linear combination of channels. They usually use a linear combination, which is similar to average of channels, but it's not exactly average. It's a linear combination of R, red, green, and blue. It gives you grayscale, right? But the other way around is too hard. You give me a grayscale image, can I make it? Because going from three channels to one channel is easy. Going from one channel, how do you extrapolate to make it three channels? You can do it with GAN. Uh, also, <laughs> you can get, get uh, zebras and make uh, horses and the other way around. <laughs> you have horses, make it zebras. Uh, another thing is, I think this is very cool. You get a, a sketch of face and it generates the, a, a realistic facial image, which is very similar to that sketch. <laughs> and the other way around, you can do it. So of course, for these, you need to have training. And they... Okay, again, for this, for making the training data set, you can apply edge detection, something like that on the facial images to get the sketch. 
So uh, you can see cycle GAN proposed in 2017 and deep face drawing proposed in 2020. As you see, they are very close to now. Another application, I think these, this application and the next application, as far as I remember, they are from the University of Southern California. Uh, am I right? You, yeah, uh, University of Southern California, because I remember I applied to that university uh, six years ago and I got rejected. <laughs> <laughs> I remember what, uh, their group was working. I think this is from that group because I remember when I was applying, but that's, <laughs> that was some, some history. Okay, so what is this? The, this bird is red. You can, you can have text to image translation. What do you mean? So you give me some descriptive caption. I generate the image for you. The other way around is also possible. So you give me some image, I generate text for you, or the harder thing, you give me a text, I generate an image from it. So for example, I, you give the text, this bird is red and brown in color with a stubby uh, beak. And then it generates this for you. Even the colors are correct. So you can say this a small bird has a white uh, breast, light gray head, and black wings and tail. Generated <laughs> this image exactly correctly. Of course, for training that, you need pairs of images and their captions. Of course. For example, for generating these, of course, they have trained on bird images where they had, they must have had the captions of those images. And they have a huge am amount of them. For example, several thousand bird images with their captions, okay? And this is generated by StackGAN. Credit, you can see their paper in reference 36. Another application, this is very cool, this. So you can have this, you can have a background, okay? So you can say, uh, I want this background and this shape, and this texture or color give me something which have the background which has the background of this image the shape of this image and the texture of this image or the color of this image and generates this for you for uh, something for example here 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 this you this figure is generated by background of this shape of this color of this you can see for background, the background is water. The shape is like this, right? The shape is like this. The color here, it's red, red and black. Interestingly, it has generated a bird, which is in this shape. Its background is the sea, water, and it's red and black. Very interesting. Very. We can make it very, Strange also, the appearance, let the appearance be like the bird, but the, with the shape of a car. <laughs> it gives you a car with the appearance of the bird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and images are from these uh, references. It's called mix and match. Of course, you mix and match these things. The, their method is called mix and match. Okay, now we talked about some uh, applications, cool applications. Let's go to adversarial autoencoder. So here, previously, variational base was used in an autoencoder setting to have variational autoencoder. Do you remember? We talked about it. We start when we were talking about variational autoencoder. We said let's just start with variational base, variational inference, and then we made it an autoencoder. We called it variational autoencoder, right? Likewise, we have adversarial learning in GAN. Let's make it in an autoencoder setup. So because it becomes adversarial-based autoencoders, right? There are sub several of them. They are mostly generated by the proposed by um, Ali Reza Mahzani. Okay, he is, he was a student of uh, um, Brendan Frey. Frey. Do you remember Frey dataset? I don't know if you have heard of that or not. Frey dataset is also generated, uh, generated by that group. Uh, Brendan Frey is a professor in 
University of Toronto. And Reza Mahsani, after uh, he finished his PhD, also he became a professor in University of Toronto. So his thesis uh, was working on adversarial based autoencoders, some of which are these. Adversarial autoencoder, AAE, proposed in 2015. I think the collaborator of this paper was Ian Goodfellow, as far as I remember. Uh, the other one is pixel GAN autoencoder, proposed in 2017. And the other one is implicit autoencoder, or IAE, proposed in 2018. Okay, adversarial autoencoder was proposed, or AAE, was proposed in 2015. What is it? It's this, the structure of adversarial autoencoder is this. You can see it in this figure. Uh, what are we doing here? So here we have blocks B1, B2, and B3, okay? With each of which it has several network layers, right? It, we have several layers for each of them. With nonlinear activation functions, of course, otherwise they will collapse into one linear layer, as we talked about it before. Okay, so AAE has an encoder or block B1. So this is encoder. B, block B1. Block B1, interestingly, can be seen as both generator and encoder. Okay, so some of the blocks have two roles, maybe. Block B1, I have block B1, block B2, and block B3. Block B3 is a discriminator, D. Block B1 is a generator, G. So because we, have, we need G and D, generator and discriminator in GAN, right? Adversarial learning. But we also need encoder and decoder for autoencoder, right? Block B1 also works as encoder and block B2 works as decoder. Okay, so encoder is B1, B1 decoder is B2. The input of encoder is a real data input, the, imp the real data. And the output of decoder is a reconstructed data. Of course, in autoencoder, we usually have real data as input and uh, reconstructed data as output, right? This is exactly what we have in autoencoder setup. So X hat is the out reconstructed data point. One of the low dimensional middle layers is the latent layer. Of course, here is the latent layer in the middle denoted by Z and it is P dimensional and P is usually much less than D, which is a dimensional input, right? Because we want to compress it in the autoencoder. It's an undercomplete autoencoder, right? The encoder and decoder model. So the encoder models this conditional distribution, P of Z, Z given X. The decoder is the other way around, is probability of X given Z, as we had it before also in variational autoencoder. Let the distribution of the latent variable be denoted by QZ. What is QZ? The prior, the desired prior distribution on the latent variable space. So I want it, I want the latent space to be Gaussian distribution. This is chosen by user, QZ. This is the posterior distribution of latent variable. Why do I call it posterior? Because QZ is prior, but I want the posterior to be similar to the prior. The blocks B1 and B3, B1 and B3, B1 is a generator also, and B3 can be seen as a discriminator in adversarial network. Uh, by the way, the prior distribution also are denoted by PZ. So QZ, I think uh, I have denoted that for P of Z given X, doesn't matter, that doesn't matter. So uh, the, the notation, the naming is not important for, it's important for you to understand what I mean. Here, we have two latent uh, spaces, do you agree? I have this and this. Do you see the difference? In GAN, we only have one latent space. In adversarial autoencoder, we have two latent spaces. One of them is uh, what we had in GAN. This is what we had in GAN, right? No, no, I can't say this is what we had in GAN because in GAN, we had both of them, as, uh, but it, they were the same thing. In GAN, we had both of these latent spaces, but they were the same thing. But now we have this, uh, separated them. So here we have one of the latent spaces here, the other one is here, okay? And this P of Z, this is, gen is chosen by user. What do I mean? For example, I assume I want it to be Gaussian. 
with some mean and covariance. Of course, okay. This prior distribution can be a standard Gaussian. Okay, let's see how it works. So the encoder of outer encoder of B1 block one is also the generator, right? G. What does it do? It generates the latent space. Here is one of the differences. I want you to notice, focus and notice the differences of adversarial autoencoder and GAN. First off, in, in GAN, we don't have any decoder. We, we don't have any encoder. We always have only decoder which generates, right? We can, do you agree that in GAN, we can see the generator as kind of a decoder? What does a decoder do? It gets latent noise. It reconstructs the output. In GAN, what does a this, uh, generator do? It gets the latent noise. It generates some data, right? So kind of in GAN, decoder plays the role of, the gen generator plays the role of decoder in autoencoder. However, encoder is absent in GAN. But in adversarial autoencoder, we are having GAN. They, we are also adding the encoder. Also, you should note that there's another difference here. I'm saying that generator, let it be encoder, generator gets X and generates Z. What did we have in GAN? It was the other way around. In GAN, generator got Z, generated X. Here, uh, in the generator is get, getting X and generating Z. Okay. And with some distribution QZ, right? The discriminator D or block B3 here, what does it do? It's a classifier with sigmoid activation function, which finds out whether the latent variable is fake or real. So in GAN, in GAN the discriminator's role was what? To find out whether the data is real or fake. In adversarial autoencoder is the other way around. The discriminator finds out whether the latent variable is fake or real. Do you get it? It's very interesting. So whether Z is real or Z is generated. And block B1, as we said, is also you can see it as a, a encoder and autoencoder, also as a generator in adversarial network. So it's shared between autoencoder and adversarial network. And autoencoder tries to generate the latent variable, which is very similar to the latent real real latent variable from the prior distribution. So this is the idea of uh, adversarial autoencoder. Again, what? Let me repeat it. I think put yourself in the shoes of Al-Riza Mahsani who proposed that. You want to propose some, some autoencoder based on adversarial learning. We know in GAN, we generated some data images and the discriminator, we have a discriminator to decide whether it's real or fake. Al-Riza Mahsani said, why not let's do it for the latent space, latent variable rather than the data. Let me generate some latent variables and find out whether it's real or fake, right? You get it? So in this way, the generator learns to generate better and better latent variables, which mimic the prior distribution PZ. So in this way, QZ, tries to mimic and become very similar to PZ. If QZ becomes PZ, then it completely fools or confuses the discriminator, right? Okay, this is the idea of adversarial autoencoder. So in now let's do the optimization. In adversarial autoencoder, we have alternating optimization where we have reconstruction phase and regularization phase. What do we have? In the reconstruction phase, the mean squared error is minimized between data X and the reconstructed data X hat. So this is exactly what we have in reconstruction autoencoder two. The reconstruction phase does exactly what we have in reconstruction autoencoder. What do we do? We have some X hat, we have some X. X hat should be very similar to X. Therefore, let's minimize the mean squared error between them. This is exactly what we do. And for that, 
we optimize B1 and B2. Why? Because both B1 and B2 play the role for generation of X hat, right? Because B1 generates Z and B2 gets Z and generates X hat. So it gives me some things. Then I'm gonna use them here in these equations of equation 22. So then in regularization phase, the discriminator and generator are updated using the GAN approach, the adversarial approach. So what do we do? We have we want to improve GAN and discriminator. Equation 22 exactly at, is adversarial learning, which we talked about it before, but on the latent variables rather than data. We should find out whether the latent variable is real or fake. And this, what is this V? This is the value function or the cost of the GAN that we had. Do you, do you understand? Okay. Uh, this was unsupervised adversarial autoencoder. Do you agree? This was unsupervised. We didn't use labels. We can have supervised and semi-supervised adversarial autoencoder too. For more information on them, refer to our tutorial paper. Uh, I've talked about them in detail in that tutorial. Also for implicit, so we have two other uh, ways to have adversarial autoencoder. One of them was pixel GAN. The other one was implicit autoencoder. For these also, you can refer to our tutorial paper. I have talked about it, about them in detail in that tutorial paper. Also, you can see the thesis of Alireza Mahsani. Acknowledgement. Some slides are, as I said, based on our tutorial paper, generative adversarial networks and adversarial autoencoders tutorial and survey. Uh, for more information on GAN and its variants, see our tutorial. Some of the variants, the tutorial paper covers all of these variants. Can you believe? All of these variants have been discussed in that tutorial paper. Let's see, vanilla GAN, we talked about it. Conditional GAN, we talked about it in this lecture. In uh, in these two were talked about it uh, in the previous lecture. DC GAN, we talked about it today. Mode collapse problem, we talked about it. Mini batch GAN, uh, we didn't cover. Unrolled GAN, Bohr GAN, mixture GAN, D2 GAN, Wasserton GAN, F GAN, adversarial variational base. So what does it do? It combines the ideas of variational autoencoder, variational learning, and adversarial learning. Bayesian GAN. Feature matching in GAN, InfoGAN, InfoGAN will is uh, uses information theory a bit in it. InfoGAN, G, GRAN, LSGAN, energy based GAN, CAT GAN, MMD GAN. What is MMD? Is short MMD is short for maximum mean discrepancy. I think I talked about it in in this course. I don't. Do you remember? I told you. Maximum mean discrepancy is a measure for finding out the differences of modes of two distribution. Do you agree? I think I talked about it. So I said, assume, assume I have two random variables, x, y, i, and x, j. Okay. And uh, each of them have some distribution. Then I want to find out how different the two distributions are. One way to do that is what? you measure the difference of their first mode. What is the first mode of distribution? Is the mean. Another one is a measure of the second mode, which is related to mean and variance. Then you can do third mode, fourth mode, but we have infinite number of nodes. How many nodes, uh, modes do you want to compare? Of course, the, uh, the first modes are more important, but uh, you, you have a lot of modes to compare. One idea is that what? Let's pull them to the Hilbert space, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and just compare the Euclidean distance there. It's a good estimation for difference of all of modes in the input space. It's very interesting. And how do they calculate that? Let, let, let's go talk about it a bit because I think that's worth it. Do you agree that I can write it? in this way, right? Because this is uh, squared L2 norm, recall preliminaries. Then I can write it as what? 
phi of x because I can apply this transpose on the elements, then it becomes phi of x i transpose phi of x i plus phi of x j transpose phi of x j minus two phi of x i transpose phi of x j because why minus two because phi of x i transpose phi of x j equals phi of x j transpose phi of x i because they are both a scalar and you can change the order of inner product right the result is a scalar then what is this this is kernel between x i and x j for more information see the lecture of kernel svm in the statistical machine learning what is this kernel of xj and xj what is this kernel of xi and xj interesting using three kernels you can calculate the difference of modes of two distributions <laughs> very interesting and that's maximum mean discrepancy so they have used mmd or maximum mean discrepancy in gan they called it mmd gan what is lap gan what is lap short for here it is short for laplacian why do they call it laplacian okay there are many things in machine learning and image processing and mathematics that they call laplacian one of them is La uh, laplacian of the graph which we'll see in the next topic uh, graph neural network the other one when you have a pyramid of images they call it Laplacian pyramid. I don't know why they call it Laplacian pyramid, but that's called Laplacian in image in computer vision. You have you you see it a lot, Laplacian pyramid. For example, one of the places that you see it a lot in computer vision is called SIFT, scale invariance feature transform. They use why do they do that? Why do they calculate a pyramid of images? Because they want. So if you compare a small image with a large image, the error is huge. Let's have a pyramid and calculate the, the differences of images in the pyramid setup. And in this way, you will have errors of different levels in the, in the pyramid. Also, for example, in SIF, they do that so that they become robust to the scale. Because if you cover different scales in the pyramid, then you will get robust to different scales. It doesn't matter whether your image it's a small or big whether your object in the image is a small or big so this is the this is the reason they use laplacian pyramid a lot in image processing and computer vision then i think you know what Lap lapgan did what does it do it generates the image in different scales of the pyramid laplacian pyramid it generates a small image then the, a bigger image then a bigger image then they found out that it works better Laplace GAN was one of the initial GANs which was proposed after the vanilla GAN. Progressive GAN, I think it's obvious, it's for a data stream. Triple GAN, LAG, GMAN, other GAN. Do you know what is other GAN? I'm not sure whether it's for adaptive GAN, but I think other GAN, as far as I remember in my memory when I was writing the tutorial, is for combination of other boost and GAN. For more information on other boosts, see my boosting lecture in the statistical machine learning course. Co-GAN, I think it's short for cooperative GAN. I'm, I don't remember. Inverse GAN, bi-GAN, Ali GAN. The bi GAN, I think it's for bidirectional GAN. Ali, Sagan, few shot GAN. Few shot means that I don't need a lot of training data. Scene GAN, interpolation and evaluation of GAN image to image translation including so these are the different gans for image to image translation patch gan cycle gan deep face drawing simulated gan interactive gan for text to image translation we have a stack gan mixing image characteristics is fine gan and mix and match and also adversarial autoencoder pixel gan and implicit autoencoder all of them have been explained in that tutorial page and some slides are inspired by teachings of Professor Ali Gotzi at the University of Waterloo. Okay, these are the references. There are a lot of references, as you see. Although I didn't cover the whole GAN tutorial, but we have a lot of references. And all of them are new, 2020, as you see. 
2000. Okay. Uh, let's have a break and come back at 8.20. And we'll, after break, we'll cover graph neural network. And also, uh, uh, after that, knowledge uh, distillation. Okay. Okay, now, now we uh, shift gear a bit and uh, we cover, uh, we go to graph neural network. Okay, graph neural network is uh, used for graph inputs, right? When your data is represented as a graph or when you can represent your data as a graph. Uh, Many real-world data sets are in the form of graphs, right? Or you can make them in the form of the graphs. Some examples are social networks. Why? Because in social networks, you see who is friend of who, for example. In protein, protein inter, uh, interaction networks, what do I mean? Usually, you might have co-crystals where one pr protein binds or docks into another protein. So you have interaction of proteins and proteins can be seen as a graph. Why? Because you can see them as a sequence of uh, amino acid or residues. When you have a sequence of amino acids, it, is a, uh, it becomes a protein. Uh, another one is internet uh, or World Wide Web. Another one is molecules because you can see them as a sequence of atoms, right? Image data also can be considered as a graph. It's very interesting. In various fields uh, have considered image as graph. One of them is graph neural network. The other one, uh, I remember there is a field uh, of probability analysis. Uh, it's called factor graphs. So factor graphs, in factor graphs, you can also consider image as a, a graph where one pixel is connected to its neighbor pixels by some edges, right? So you can see every pixel uh, as, a, uh, as a vertex or node of the graph where the uh, nearby pixels are connected to each other. Every image is a graph where each pixel represents a node or vertex connected by edges to its adjacent pixels. Text data also uh, can be considered as graph. Why? Every token or word, because in natural language processing, you can consider words as tokens. Every token or word can be a node connected by an edge to its next token or word. Right? Every word is connected to its next word or previous word. There are several tasks in graph processing. So when we, we process graphs, we can have several tasks. One of them is graph level task. The other one is node level task. And the other one is edge level task. Let's compare them. So graph level task, it predicts the property of an entire graph altogether. Example, predict whether an antibody protein binds to an antigen protein or not. As I said, we have co-crystals, antibody and antigen. It is used also in drug discovery. Why? In drug discovery, you usually have an antigen or disease in your body, and the drug is an antibody. The drug antibody needs to dock or bind to the antigen, take and takes takes it and kills it, right? So you want to find out whether an entire graph is a co-crystal or not, for example. So you can predict, uh, make a, pre a prediction for the entire graph. And this prediction can be either regression or classification or any task, right? Another thing, the task is node level task. What do you do? We predict the identity or role of every node in the graph. Rather than the entire graph, every node of the graph. Example, every node has some features. So every node can be a vector, right? 
with has every node can have a feature vector and there is a label for every node so in regular data sets we had data points every data point was a feature vector and it had some label right here also every node has some feature vector and some label and this label if it is classification task it's discrete if it's per, uh, regression it's continuous right for instance if the nodes correspond to people the label can be whether the person lives in a specific city or not for example the node corresponds to people i have one node you have one node and we each of us has a feature vector for example uh, how angry i am or what is my skin color what what is my ethnicity what is my gender what is uh, uh, my psychological properties i have different properties right features you also have some features and then based on the features we can find out whether each of us the label can be whether that person lives in a specific city or not for example edge level task predict the identity or role of every edge in the graph okay example recommender systems in what is recommender system? It's used a lot in uh, Netflix and other uh, uh, movie companies uh, or sh movie showing companies. For example, what do I mean? For a recommender system is recommend to the users. So we usually have some users and some movies, right? Or some other products such as movies. And the, the, each user has uh, rated some of the movies some of them was not all of the movies because there are a lot of movies and not a user can rate all of them and now the task in recommender system is that based on the rates that a specific user has given to the movies can i predict what rate it he or she would give to a, an unseen movie this is and if the rate is high then i recommend that movie to that person that's the recommender system so for movie suggestion, right, to users. Some, some nodes here are the users and some nodes are the movies. So now we have two categories of nodes. Some nodes are users, some nodes are movies. And it's a bipartite uh, graph. What do I mean? It's a bipartite graph, meaning that uh, I have some users, I have some movies and all, always have connections from this part to this part okay and each connection edge means that that person has rated that movie right and edge between a user and the movie exists if the user has rated that movie and the label of the edge is the rating score right so here in edge ta level task we have label for edges in node level task we have label for nodes so here now it is possible to predict the label or score of an of a non-existing edges between the user and a movie. Therefore, it's a regression problem. Right? Because a score is a continuous score between zero and one, for example. Okay, as was said, images are special cases of graphs, right? Because we said every pixel can be seen as a node connected to its adjacent nodes. The graph of a of an image is called the Euclidean graph or a grid graph. Okay. But what if there is a graph with some arbitrary structure or irregular shape? Because the shape of the graph of image is regular. It's like this, right? If consider this node, this pixel is connected to its adjacent pixel, right? However, what if the graph is irregular such as this? then it becomes harder, right? In convolutional neural network or CNN, which we talked about before, there is convolution of a filter kernel with the image, right? We have that. The question is how to define convolution of a filter kernel with the arbitrary graph rather than a grid graph, okay? We want to define the convolution of a filter kernel with an arbitrary graph okay so graph Fourier transform consider a graph 
G V E. So we usually denote graph in this way. G stands for graph, V stands for vertices, the set of vertices, and E stands for the set of edges. With nodes V or vertices V, edges E. Let the number of nodes be N. So we have N nodes. The adjacency matrix A is N by N matrix, uh, whose IJ element is one if the node I is connected to the node J and otherwise it's zero. So if node I is connected to node J, then uh, IJ element of A is one, otherwise zero. If the graph is undirected, of course, the adjacency matrix becomes symmetric. If it's directed, it's not necessarily symmetric. What do I mean by undirected graph? It means that the edges of, between the nodes are undirected. There is no direction. But if there is a direction on the edge, for example, this, this is a directed edge, and this is an undirected edge. When it is undirected edge, uh, the gra undirected graph, what does it mean? When node I is connected to node J, node J is also connected to node I. In that case, adjacency matrix becomes symmetric. The degree matrix of the matrix A, it's defined in equation one. What is that? It's a diagonal matrix whose I ith element in the diagonal is the summation of the ith row of the matrix A. What do I mean? So this is matrix A, assume. So I, this is the first row. I add all of these elements. Then I put here, the first one, one element. So the second row, I add them, put them in two, two element of D. The last row, I add them, I put in the nth element of D. So this becomes a diagonal matrix, right? As you see, summation of Aij, where j goes from one to n. So we are summing every row. This is a degree matrix. Laplacian matrix of the graph G is defined in equation two. Laplacian matrix is an n by n matrix here. Laplacian matrix of graph G or, for, or the adjacency matrix is D minus A. So the degree matrix minus the, ma the matrix itself, right? That's Laplacian denoted by L. There exists some other variants of Laplacian matrix. You can see it as kind of a, norm, a normalized Laplacian matrix. Um, is this, it's defined in equation three. So rather than equation two, you can use, rather than saying D minus A, you can say D to the power of minus alpha A times D to the power of minus alpha, okay? Usually alpha is, set to half. So it's kind of e to the power of minus half a d to the power, power mi minus half. And this is usually called a normalized Laplacian matrix. And here we use a normalized Laplacian. When, when we say Laplacian, we, we mean normalized Laplacian. By the way, alpha here is, is a non-negative uh, variable. Consider the eigenvalue decomposition of the normalized Laplacian matrix. Recall preliminaries for eigenvalue decomposition. L is U V, sorry, U, uh, U lambda, I think it's lambda. Yes, U lambda, uh, U transpose. Where U, its columns are the eigenvectors of Laplacian matrix and lambda is a diagonal matrix whose diagonal elements are the eigenvalues. Right. Then the eigenvectors of the normalized Laplacian, which are the columns of U, U1 to UN, they are called Fourier functions. So it's this notation. We are we call them Fourier functions. Fourier, what is Fourier transform now? Fourier transform is projecting a signal X on the Fourier function. Do you remember? So uh, in PCI, in different algorithms in machine learning, we had U transpose X or U transpose X 
what does it do here x is projected onto the column space of u in this one x is projected onto the vector u Fourier transform projects a signal x onto the Fourier functions and the Fourier functions are the eigen vectors u1 to un the result is is the coefficients of the Fourier series Fourier series I think if you have passed the signal processing course, you have seen Fourier series and Fourier transform. Here we also can have them. Okay. Graph Fourier transform, what does it do? It projects the input graph signal to a space whose orthonormal bases are the eigenvectors of the normalized Laplacian of the graph. So what do I mean? Do you remember the columns of matrix U, U1 to UN? If, right? The column space of this might matrix U, if I project a graph <laughs> X for, <coughs> Okay, if I project a graph X onto the column space of matrix U, it's U transpose X, right? Recall preliminaries. Then this is called graph Fourier transform when X is a graph. And U uh, is a matrix of eigenvectors for the Laplacian matrix of the graph. For now, for now, assume that every node of the graph has a scalar feature value. For now, okay. So every node has a scale scalar feature value. Then, so x x one is a scalar is the embedding feature embedding of node one. X n is the feature embedding of node n. If I put them in a col in a ve column vector, I denote it by vector x, which is an n dimensional vector, right? Let this n-dimensional vector be the vector of features of all nodes in the graph, where xi is uh, the feature vector for the ith node. Okay. The graph Fourier transform of this x is this, as we talked about it in the preliminaries. It's u transpose x, right? I denote it by x hat or f of x. What does it do? It projects X onto the column space of the matrix U. What is column space? Is a space whose bases are the columns of U. In other words, it's a space spanned by the columns of U. Okay. What do I mean by spanned or by whose basis is the columns of U? I mean the linear combination, every vector in that space can be seen as a linear combination of those bases, the columns of U. The inverse graph Fourier transform, what does it do? It reconstructs that after projection. So U transpose X is projection. Now U, U transpose X reconstructs that, recall preliminaries. So therefore you can see it as U F of X hat, right? I denote it by F hat of X, if F inverse X hat, it's reconstructed back. For more information, see the preliminaries of the course. Graph convolution of the input signal X with the filter G is defined as this. So X convolve with G. So I have some inputs X and the graph filter, the filter G, okay? I have some field. Here I'm trying to, so before in convolution neural network, we had convolution, right? Now we, are, we wanna generalize that for convolution on the graph. So I have input signal X and the filter G. Their convolution, you can see it as this. Why? Do you remember? There it was in, if you have passed any signal processing course. So in one domain, when you have convolution, for Fourier, uh, Fourier, Laplace, and all of them. When you have convolution, and the other domain is uh, it's multiplication. Therefore, you go to the domain of, for example, time. F of x times f of g 
then you have inverse to bring it to the other domain. So you have f of f inverse, f of x and f of g, right? Then f of x is u transpose x. f of g is u transpose g, right? Also, we know that f inverse multiplies by u. So the whole thing is u, u transpose x, u transpose g, right? Now let's define a diagonal matrix whose diagonal is uh, u transpose g. So what was u, u or u transpose is n by n, do you remember? And g is n by one. Therefore, the whole thing is n by one. This u transpose g is a vector. Now put this vector in the diagonal of a matrix. So u1 transpose g until un transpose g, right? This gives you a diagonal matrix. I denote it by g and it's, it's n by n, the capital G, okay? Now, if we use equation nine in equation eight, we can write equation eight in matrix form in this way. So x convolved with g becomes u, g, u transpose x. Why? So here we have u transpose g, right? But as I have this multiplication, g comes here. If you don't believe that, just put this definition of g here and just multiply the terms of the, uh, the do the matrix multiplications and you will see it's equivalent to equation eight. Then, so x convolved with g becomes u, g, u transpose x. If every node has a feature vector, so now I'm gonna, I want to relax the assumption which I made initially. I said, let the, every node have a scalar feature. What if every node has a d-dimensional feature? Then I will have a matrix x, n by d, n rows, D features uh, n rows for n nodes and D features per each node, right? Then the con convolution becomes U, G, U transpose capital X. So the previous one was small x. The previous one, the result of convolution was an in n dimensional vector, but now it becomes an n by D dimensional vector. So this is graph convolution. Now we go to ChepNet, which is one of the most important and fundamental things in graph neural networks. So convolutional graph neural networks have been built upon two main approaches, a spectral methods and a spatial methods. A spectral methods, they have a graph signal processing perspective. Spatial methods, they define graph convolution by information propagation. So when you have two approaches, so in a spectral methods, you, it, its perspective is graph signal processing, okay? But, uh, in uh, spatial methods, we have graph convolution by information propagation. Graph convolutional network or GCN, reference five, it bridged the gap between a spectral and a spatial methods. We are gonna explain it. Recall equation 11. What was equation 11? This one, do you remember? X convolved with G is U, G, U transpose X. We just proved that. Okay. If the input of the ELF layer is denoted by H L minus one and the output of the ELF layer be HL. So the, consider the ELF layer, one of the layers in the network. The input, let it be HL minus one and the output be HL and the HL goes to the next layer, right? Then we can write that equation in this way. Because in the equation 11, we only assumed we have one layer. We have one graph convolution. But 
in graph convolutional network, we have a stack of graph convolution. First layer is a graph convolution. The second layer is a, another graph convolution, right? And the output of every graph convolution becomes the input of the next graph convolution. Therefore, I can write it in this way. H of L, which is the output of convolution. This, this was equation 11, but rather than X, I have put H L minus one, which is out of the previous layer. Also, I'm adding this sigma. What is this sigma? This is activation function, nonlinear activation function. Can be, for example, sigma or whatever, relu. Right? So I have a graph convolution. I apply a nonlinear activation function, and then the next graph convolution, then the nonlinear activation function. So this gives me graph convolutional network. The first layer, of course, H0 is X. The input of the first layer is the data. A big limitation of equation 12, which we saw this equation. There is a big limitation with that. What is that? U. What is the problem of U? Can you tell me? In equation 12, there is a big pro problem for calculation of U. How did we calculate you? Tell me. What? What was you? Do you remember? Yes, uh, I, these are the Fourier, uh, I agree, Fourier uh, coefficients. But what, what, were, what did we call as the Fourier coefficients? They were? What? The eigenvectors of Laplacian matrix, right? Therefore, for calculating U, we need to do eigenvalue decomposition of the Laplacian matrix, right? The Laplacian matrix is N by N. What if N is huge? What if we have too, what if we have too many nodes? Well, what if the graph is too big? And this actually happens. In image, we have too many pixels. In social media, we have too many users right then calculation of u becomes a big problem because eigenvalue decomposition is time consuming what is its complexity is o n cubed so when n goes up the computer freezes <laughs> right so chapnet proposed in 2016 tried to resolve this issue improves the computational complexity of the convolutional neural network. What does it do? It approximates the filter G that we had by Chebyshev polynomials of the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues lambda. We will see how this improves the time complexity. We'll see that. But its idea is that let's approximate the filter G, which we use in graph convolution, by Chebyshev polynomials of the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues lambda. When I say, uh, and I think uh, you know why we call it Chebnet, right? It uses Chebyshev polynomials, hence, hence the name Chebnet. Cheb stands for Chebyshev. The Chebyshev polynomials, let's recall that. The Chebyshev polynomials was is, uh, shown in equation 14. So this is polynomials for, we denoted by T, for example, T zero X is one. So, so for zero, T zero X, we define it to be one. T one X is X. And for the rest of the elements, it's a kind of recursive. T I X is two X times T I minus one X minus T I minus two X, right? So every element depends on its two previous ones. In this sense, it's similar to Fibonacci series, right? So this is Chebyshev polynomials. The domain of input X for Chebyshev polynomials is between minus one and one, okay? So X here in this equation should be between minus one and one. For example, the Chebyshev polynomials are widely used for cosine expressions because cosine is between minus one and one, right? And interestingly, this is a famous formula. Cosine of alpha i 
is Ti cosine of alpha. Okay. For example, cosine of, you tell me, cosine of zero alpha is T zero cosine of alpha. What is T zero? It's one. Cosine of alpha is what? T one of cosine of alpha. What is T one? It's cosine of alpha. <laughs> cosine of alpha is T cosine of alpha. What is cosine of two alpha? T two cosine of alpha. And using this equation, it's two cosine of alpha t uh, one cosine of t one t one cosine of alpha, which is cosine of alpha, minus t zero cosine of alpha, which is one. What is this two cosine of two cosine squared alpha minus one? This is the formula that we had in high school. Cosine of two alpha is two cosine squared alpha minus one. Okay, Chepnet, as I said, approximates the filter G by a linear combination of Chebyshev polynomials of the eigenvalues lambda. So this is exactly what Chepnet does. So we have, what is this? The uh, Chebyshev polynomials of eigenvalues lambda, eigenvalues of Laplace and matrix, right? And what is this theta i? Because I have linear combination. These are the coefficients of the linear combination. For i go, goes from one to k. The more k, the better approximation, right? Where k is the order of Chebyshev polynomials. However, we'll see how it improves the time complexity. We'll see that. However, there is a problem with the domain of Chebyshev polynomials in this equation, what, why? Who says that the eigenvalues are between minus one and one? It should be between minus one and one to be fed to the Chebyshev polynomial. Therefore, assume the largest eigenvalue is lambda max. Then we need to normalize the eigenvalues by this equation, two over lambda max, lambda minus identity matrix with the size n by n. Why? In this way, all of the eigenvalues becomes bet be become between minus one and one. Why? Because assume that lambda max is something. So you have lamp between zero and lambda max, then by two over lambda max, so two times this becomes, it becomes between zero and two, and minus one, it becomes between zero and one. No, no, G give me a second. it becomes between minus one and one, right? So here I'm saying that this is one over lambda max, and then this is times two. No, no, sorry, this is minus one here. This is two over lambda max. So the first step here is multiplication by two over lambda max, which is done here. And the second step here is one, minus one. Right, agreed? Okay. So then the eigenvalues become between minus one and one. I denote it by uh, lambda tilde, which is an N by N matrix again. Then therefore I use equation 16, right? I replace lambda with lambda tilde, normalized eigenvalues. Now let's put it back in equations 10, do you remember? U, G, U transpose X. This was the convolution of X and G. Uh, I can replace G with what I had in previous slide, this approximation. So it becomes U, this linear combination of Chebyshev polynomials, U transpose X. Then what am I doing? I bring this U inside the summation. I can do that. Theta i is a scalar, right? So I'm, I brought this u here. Okay. The matrix u is orthogonal. That is, its columns are orthonormal. Why? Because it's the matrix of eigenvectors. One of the properties of eigenvectors is that they are uh, uh, orthonormal. For an orthonormal transformation, the following holds. This equation holds. I can say u t 
uh, ti lambda tilde u transpose, I can bring this u and u tilde inside the transformation. Okay. And um, similar to equation 15, what was equation 15? This, similar to this normalization that we had, we define this L tilde is two over lambda max L minus I, where L is the Laplacian matrix, right? And lambda max is the largest eigenvalue of the normalized Laplacian matrix. Then we have this. Why do we have this equation 20? Because we had previously, we had L U is a U, uh, del, uh, U uh, what was this notation? Um, U, U uh, delta, U delta U transpose. Then if you replace these eigenvalues with the normalized eigenvalues, L also becomes normalized, this L tilde, right? Now, what am I doing here? Here in equation 18 that I had, compare this equation 18 and equation 20. Compare these two. I can, if you put equation 20 in equation 18, it gives you equation 21. So U Ti lambda tilde, U transpose becomes Ti L tilde. Now put this equation 21 in equation 17. It gives you equation 22. Right? Right? Okay. So this is the convolution. N now what do we have? Again, uh, compare equation 22 and uh, 12. So this is equation 22 that we just found. And this is equation 12 that we had before. I'm repeating it here. Okay. Compare these two equations. Chepnet resolves the limitation of eigenvalue decomposition of the Laplace and Y because previously in uh, regular convolutional gra uh, graph neural network, we had U. And how can we calculate U? By eigenvalue decomposition of L. However, here, we don't have U anymore. We only have the Chebyshev polynomials of Laplace and matrix. We don't do any eigenvalue decomposition. So this is regular graph convolution that we talked about. This is Chepnet. So we started in Chepnet. We started from the Chebyshev polynomials of eigenvalues of the Laplace term. However, we ended up with the Chebyshev polynomials of the Laplace term itself. Therefore, we don't need to do any eigenvalue decomposition. Very interesting. So it improves the complexity by eliminating eigenvalue decomposition completely. Okay. In fact, it uses the approximation of Chebyshev polynomials and does not perform eigenvalue decomposition. Now, that was a regular uh, graph convolution and also Chepnet. There is another thing, graph convolutional network proposed in 2017. What it does, it's a special case of Chepnet, okay? It's the first order approximation of the Chepnet. Do you remember? We had K in Chepnet. That's a hyperparameter. How many polynomials do you want to have? Graph convolutional network or GCN says, let it be one, let K be one. So I only get T0 and T1, okay? So do you remember we had TI L tilde in the Chepnet, if you use k1 and 0 and 1, then it becomes t0 l tilde plus t1 l tilde, right? I mean the summation. I from 1 to k becomes this. In other words, I'll have z k, k equals 1, right? k equals 1. Then if you put it in the formula that we found for Chepnet, you will have only these two terms. Theta zero, uh, T zero L tilde X plus theta one, T one L tilde X. 
and con recall the formula formula for uh, Chebyshev polynomials. What was t zero of something? Was do you remember? It was one, one. Therefore, I can replace it with one. What was t one of something? It's itself l tilde. Therefore, it, it gives me this equation, right? More number of, also, do you remember? The more number of layer number parameters we have, the more we are prone to overfitting. More number of layer number parameters may result in overfitting if we don't have enough data. So it, it uh, makes the risk of overfitting higher, right? Therefore, in order to avoid overfitting, let's reduce the number of parameters. Therefore, we have theta zero and theta one, let them be equal to each other. And I denote it by theta because I wanted to become simpler, have less number of layer number, because theta is layer number parameter, theta zero and theta one. Why don't, do I have two thetas? Let, let, me, I assume, let me assume they are equal to each other, theta. Then, Factor out theta, it gives you theta. Uh, this is identity matrix plus L tilde times X. Okay, then L tilde, recall what we had for L tilde in equation. In equ where was that? Equ equation nine, 19. So I replace L tilde with equation 19. Right? Then what, what? These two cancel each other. I minus I. Therefore, I will have this. Okay? And it is possible to absorb the constant 2 over lambda x. This is constant, right? Into the layer number parameters theta. Why? Because if you want it, in this case, you wanted to learn some theta, then you, if you absorb it, you will kind of learn two over lambda max over two times that thing, right? So you can absorb the constants in, uh, in if they are multiplied by the layer number parameters in the layer number parameters. And then it's, uh, we can simplify it. Therefore, this becomes only theta Lx, all right? Then according to equation four, do you remember L, the normal, L was a normalized Laplace and matrix, which was D, to the power of minus half, a d to the power of minus half, right? So equation 24 is a graph convolution in graph convolutional network. Okay, let's continue. This is what we had, I'm repeating it. It has been empirically observed now. So there is something empirically observed there. This, results in instability in stability in training of GCN. It will, it will be a bit unstable. Therefore, we make an additional assumption empirically that to have self loops on the nodes, meaning that every node has an edge from it to itself. Let everyone be its own friend, for example, in social network, okay? Then you will have something like this. So in addition to these edges, let's have self loops. Empirically, they have found out that this makes it a bit more stable in training. So for doing that, mathematically, what does it mean? When you have adjacency matrix, add it with the identity matrix. What is identity matrix? It's diagonal is one and the rest is zero. So when you do that, it means that every node is connected to itself, right? At this is matrix plus I, it means that the diagonal, every node is connected to itself. Then it gives you A tilde. I denote it by A tilde. Let the degree matrix of A tilde be denoted by D tilde. And let the Laplacian, the normalized Laplacian matrix of A tilde, this modified graph, be L bar, okay, I don't denote it by L tilde because I had L tilde before. Then 
what we found in graph convolutional network, let's replace, we had D to the power of minus half A, D to the power of minus half, but this time we replace it with D tilde to the power of minus half, A tilde, D tilde to the power of minus half. I also denote this by L bar. So it gives me theta L bar X, right? This is graph convolution in graph convolution network. In matrix form, when we have D dimensional feature vector for every node, then this equation becomes L bar X theta, where theta here is a D dimensional vector. Previously here, it was a scalar, but now becomes a vector because I have D dimensional embedding per node, right? If there is a need to have F feature maps after the convolution, so because do you remember? So far, we always thought that at every layer, we have one convolution, right? But in recall convolutional neural networks, in every layer, we might have a feature maps. We might have several channels of convolution. If we have F feature maps after convolution, then the equation becomes this. The theta becomes a matrix. This is capital theta, sorry. A matrix of D by F. So I, D became a vector, theta became a vector, D dimensional vector. Then if we have F features, it becomes a D by F dimensional matrix. Okay. So this is my equation here. As a result now, let's again go back to the layer wise thing. So I have several layers back to back. Therefore, I can replace this X with the previous H. This H here stands for hidden layer, right? H L minus one, the output of previous hidden layer. Sigma here is the activation function. And this is what we found here in this equation. And H, it gives me the output of this layer, H. You see this? This is one of the most important formulas in graph neural networks. Okay. Equation 26 that we've just found is the graph convolution performed in every layer of graph convolutional network where theta is a matrix of learnable weights in the layer. Okay. Comparing equations 12 and 26, let's compare them. You will see that GCN has all, doesn't have the problem of eigenvalue decomposition also. In regular graph convolution, we had U, which is the eigenvectors of Laplacian matrix, but in GCN, graph convolutional network, we don't have that. We don't, we have L tilde, L, L, sorry, L bar, and L bar has A tilde and D tilde. There is no eigenvalue decomposition. Again, why? Because it's a special case of Chebnet, and Chebnet didn't have this issue. In the fully connected layer of a feed forward neural network, now let's compare graph convolutional network and fully connected net network or feed forward network. Let's compare them. Do you agree that equation 27 is what we have in feed forward neural network? H L minus one is the output of previous layer. I have some theta, some weights, a linear transformation of the output of the previous layer. Then I apply activation function. It gives me the output. Previously in the previous lectures, we denoted that by theta transpose H L minus one, but doesn't matter. You, you can define it to be here with some change of, it depends on how you define theta. Okay, it's a linear transformation anyway. However, what we have in graph convolutional network, it's this equation 28. Compare equation 27 and 28. Very similar actually, very similar, but there is a difference. Here is a difference. Sorry, the difference is only in this L bar, in this. 
it's kind of a Laplacian matrix, right? And now I think it's, you understand it, that this equation 28 that we just found makes sense. Why? It's actually very similar to feed forward neural network, but it filters the nodes. So in, you can see uh, fully connected neural network in a way that every node is impacted by all other nodes. But in graph convolutional network, we said every node is not connected to all other nodes. If, every, if, if it is a fully connected network, it reduces to feed forward neural network. But as every node is connected to only several other nodes, let's have a, using the adjacency matrix, have this term. When a node is not connected to some other node, this A tilde becomes zero. Do you agree? In the adjacency matrix. So it means that question 28 becomes zero. It doesn't have the impact of that node on it. But when it is connected to its neighbor nodes, then you will see its impact. So when not connected to a node, A tilde becomes zero, that element. Therefore, HL becomes zero. Not have impact from that node. Also, when complete graph or fully connected graph, it means that all nodes are connected, what happens? It becomes fully connected, reduces to fully connected or feed forward layer, right? Now let's go to more general frameworks for graph convolutional network. The update rule of every layer, what was that equation 28? Can be restated in this way. What was equation 28? It was this, right? So I have theta h, I also had theta h there, theta h, but I'm now I'm writing it in vector form. Also, rather than this Laplacian here, I can say only sum over the neighbors, only sum over the neighbors. And I denotes the neighbors of the ith node, the set of the neighbors of the ith node. This is called sum pooling. Why? Because it sums over the neighbors. Sum pooling. There is a problem with sum pooling. And what is that? Summing the contents of the neighboring nodes or neurons increases the scale of the output because when you sum some numbers, the summation becomes big, right? And when you go layer by layer, this becomes bigger and bigger. So it gradually on multiple layers, over multiple layers, it becomes big. To resolve this issue, it is possible to normalize the input of the activation function by D tilde inverse. And D tilde was the degree matrix, do you remember? So I can have this. Again, here, I'm writing it in matrix form again. Back here, it was vector form. Now back to the matrix form. Uh, this equation can be restated in now node-wise or vector form. Again, back to the vector form. Compare equation 29 and 31. The difference is this, this normalization factor. Why are these two equivalent? According to the definition of degree matrix. Because degree matrix sums of the rows of the adjacent symmetric. So it's it's every ith row, so it's i ith element is cardinality of n i, right? Cardinality of n i. 
its ith element is cardinality of ni right the size how many neighbors the ith node has right and we know that d tilde is a diagonal matrix according to linear algebra it's inverse is the inverse of its diagonal elements the inverse of a diagonal matrix is a diagonal matrix whose elements are the inverse of the elements of that diagonal matrix okay then therefore it's d therefore d tilde i i inverse is one over cardinality of nr exactly what we have here right and this is called mean pooling because we are kind of taking mean. We can make it symmetric normalization. So rather than the only, what did we have before? This term. Now for, for it to be symmetric, we can have this similar to what we have in Laplacian, right? Definition of normalized Laplacian. Then, if we would write it in node-wise way, it will be like this. We will have this normalization factor. It's called mean pooling with symmetric normalization. Now compare this equation with what we had in graph convolution network. You will see that GCN or graph convolution network is using mean pooling with symmetric normalization, right? So it's a more general framework. You can have other things. You can have some pooling. You have you can have mean pooling with asymmetric normalization. This equation thirty three means that for every node i, if the node j is a neighbor, its impact on the ith ith node should be more. So let's analyze this equation thirty three. Why does it make sense? Can you tell me? Consider in the summation, consider uh, node J, okay? Node J is one of the NI, right? Then, no, no, consider node I, sorry. Node I, it has several neighbors. This, 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 okay? Now consider node J, which is one of the neighbors of NI, uh, the I node, okay? Consider two cases. One case is that NG, the J node is connected to too many other nodes like this. In addition to connecting to J to I, it is also connecting to too many other nodes. Do you agree that I shouldn't care much from the impact of node J to the no, node of node I? Do you agree? Consider these, to co compare these two cases. This is I, this is J. So this is similar to this, but the difference is that this J is here, it's connected to only three things, one of which is I. Here, J is connected to a hundred nodes. Here, only three nodes. Of course, when J is connected to only three nodes, one of which is I, its impact is should be more considered on I because I is on only one of the few neighbors of J. I is few, one of the few neighbors of J. Here, I is kind of lost between the neighbors of the J. Therefore, I shouldn't care much about it. Now, this equation is exactly doing that. Because here, I have nj also in the denominator in addition to ni. When nj is large, 1 over nj is too small. Therefore, I don't consider its impact much. But when nj is a small, I consider its impact. Did, did you understand? Now, different tasks that we talked about, node classification or regression, graph classification or regression, link classification or regression. If it is node classification, we take the edge that we found, edge of the last layer, for example. Do you remember? We had hidden layers 
in the update tool that we found. Then get the last layer, maybe H I, and using some function F or some layer, you decide about that node. If it is graph task, graph level task, you get the edges of all nodes. And you, you decide based on that. But if it is a link or edge task, then for, for example, the edge between i-th node and j-th node, z-i-j, you decide based on h-i, h-j, and e-i-j. h-i, uh, what we found for i-th node, j -th, what we found for j-th node, and e-i-j, the link between them. And e-i-j can be a vector. Every uh, edge can have a feature vector. Now let's talk about graph attention network. Do you remember we talked about attention mechanism and transformers? This work, this work, graph attention network, combines the idea of attention mechanism and graph neural network. Do you remember what we had in equations 29, 31, and 33, which we saw before? We had linear combination. Do you remember? In mean pooling, sum pooling, in pooling, right? And this linear combination can have weights. Do you remember? For example, in uh, sum pooling, the weights were one. In mean pooling, the weights were one over cardinality of Ni. In mean pooling with symmetric normalization, it was one over square root of cardinality of Ni and cardinality of Nj. We just saw that. However, atten graph attention network says, let me learn the weights. Let me learn the weights using attention mechanism. And I think it, whenever you have weights, weighting, you can think of attention. Because as we saw before, attention is nothing but simple weighting. Weighting. For example, I said, when you look at Mona Lisa portrait, you weight the pixels. You see at her face rather than her background. Right? So graph attention network proposed in 2017, it uses attention mechanism for finding the weights. Again, this is exactly what we've had, the linear combination in graph neural network, but now I'm replacing the weights with alpha ij and let the alpha ij be learned by attention between hi of previous layer and hj of previous layer. It's the attention of the i-th node and j-th node between them, right? This can be, this attention can be computed by an attention function between these two. Let the attention function be denoted by A, okay? And this attention function can also get the edge between i and j node. It is possible. So this attention function can be a transformer autoencoder, can be tra transformer that we talked about. However, the graph attention network models attention function as a single layer feed forward neural network. They train a single layer feed forward neural network for calculating the attention. And it finds the best attention weights for their own task. Finally, the attention values of every node are normalized in a softmax form to obtain the attention weights. Why? Because I want. Also, we had this uh, the same idea in, in transformer. In transformer, we had the same idea. We want the weights to sum to one. Right. So we use the softmax form. The summation in the de denominator notes that it's over the neighbors of, of the ith node. They use multi-head attention. So what do I mean by multi recall transformer lecture? They do attention, they calculate attention for several times. So as you see, each color in this figure is one of the attentions in the multi-head attention. So they calculate attentions in different ways. Then they kind of concatenate or average 
these attention weights, because do you remember in multi attention, we also concatenated them. They also concatenate or average them to get one attention score. Transformers that we talked about previously are a special cases of graph neural network. Can you believe that? In fact, every sentence or sequence can be considered as a graph where graph at, but sorry, this should be a special cases of graph attention, frequent, I guess, neural networks. So every sequence, sentence or sequence can be considered as a graph where graph attention network can calculate the attention between the tokens in the se sequence. Do you agree? Example this. this. This is a sentence. Consider this sentence. This is a sentence. For every token or word, you can consider a note. This is a sentence. This is also a sentence. This is also a sentence. And consider the, the token this. This is assumed the ith node. Then the jth node can be each of these. You can calculate the attention between them. Interesting. So you can see transformer as a special case of graph attention network. Uh, in the following, graph attention network and transformer are compared. In graph attention network, the attention is this. We just saw that, right? The attention is this, AIJ, the attention between HI and HJ, where HI L minus one and HJ L minus one are passed through a single layer network with some weight W. Do, do you remember I said uh, GAT or graph attention network, uh, network? What does it do? It calculates attention using a single layer network this is and let the weight so the weight of that single layer network be the matrix w therefore attention is calculated between w transpose h i l minus one and w transpose h j l minus one after feeding to the single layer of network right in transformer on the other hand the attention is between q i and k j do you remember query and uh, key what was query it was W Q transpose X and Q was W K transpose X and W Q and W K were learnable parameters, right? Therefore, the difference of GAT and uh, graph attention network and transformer is that GAT uses the shared learnable ways. These are the same W for query and key, but transformer uses different learnable ways for them. This is one difference. Another difference between GAT and transformer is that GAT uses a single layer fit forward neural network as the attention function. However, in transformer, this function was this. Do you remember? We had it. This was the attention. Where P is a dimensionality of query and key. The last difference of GAT and transformer is the softmax form. In GAT, it's in the denominator, it sums over the neighbors in the denominator of softmax. However, transformer sums over all tokens in the sequence. Right? Now, graph autoencoder. So, so far we talked about graph neural network. Now, this one is graph autoencoder. So, it has two variants graph. Reconstruction autoencoder and graph variational autoencoder. Okay, let's see. Consider the following autoencoder where the encoder has two layers. So we have encoder and decoder, right? Let the encoder has have two layers. The encoder accepts a graph as its input. Hence, its name is graph autoencoder or GAE proposed in 2016 by Max Welling et al. Okay, you can't believe how short this paper is. I think it's two or three pages, <laughs> but it explains a lot of math in it. So according to equation 26, the first layer of the encoder is this. Do you remember? We had this equation. 
The first layer was, as I said, this is the most famous formula of graph neural network. And theta one here is a layer number weight matrix of the first layer. X is a feature vectors of the nodes stacked row wise. So it's N by D. Let every node have a D dimensional feature vector. L bar is defined in equation 25. We, we talked about it. It's based on the adjacency matrix of the graph where we assume that we have self loops. Sigma here is usually the ReLU activation function. H1 is the out output of the first layer in the encoder, right? Again, we use now for the second layer, we use equation 26, where we use the output of the first layer as input of the second layer. And theta two is a layer number weight matrix of the second layer. H2 is the output of this second layer. I don't have any activation function, why? Because I don't want to put any bound in the latent space. Putting equation 39 in equation 40 combines the two uh, layers together, then it gives me this. I denote it by GCN, graph uh, convolutional network. GCN of XA, A is the adjacent symmetric, theta one and theta two. It gives me this, right? Put equation 39 in 40, it gives you equation 41, right? Now, as I said, there are two types of graph. Uh, uh, graph autoencoder, graph reconstruction autoencoder, which is deterministic, and graph variational autoencoder, which is stochastic. These autoencoders are introduced here. So, in the graph reconstruction autoencoder, also called the non -probabilist probabilistic graph autoencoder, the encoder is equation 41 with two layers. That we, this is encoder. The p-dimensional latent embeddings of the nodes denoted by z, z is n by p, is exactly the output of encoder. Similar to what we have in reconstruction autoencoder, regular one, feed forward reconstruction autoencoder. Z is n by p, why? Because I have n nodes, each of which has p-dimensional latent embedding. Now the interesting idea is this. The idea of graph autoencoder is this. I have some adjacency matrix in the input space. I can also calculate an adjacency matrix in the latent space. These two adjacency matrices should match. Although the dimensionality of input space and latent space differ, but I know the adjacency matrix is n by n. So it doesn't care about, so it doesn't change. Its dimensionality doesn't change with uh, dimensionality of data, right? Interestingly here, A is N by N. Here, another A, I can have maybe A hat, A prime, it's also N by N. Therefore, I can compare them. Although here it's P-dimensional data, here is D-dimensional data. So I can calculate Z, Z, transpose, which is the inner product, inner product of the embeddings, latent uh, vectors. Why is it ZZ transpose? Usually in my courses, Z transpose Z is the inner product. Here is ZZ transpose inner product, why? Because the latent vectors are stacked row-wise rather than column-wise. Okay, therefore, ZZ transpose is the inner product of p-dimensional latent variables. Then I use sigmoid activation function. Why? Because I want it to become zero and between zero and one. A score of similarity of latent variable between zero and one. Because inner products measure this score of similarity, right? Then I, as I said, this is a sigmoid function, right? So it, I apply sigmoid function elements wise. Assume this is the ij element. So it gives me this, right? Then 
the idea is this the idea is that the similarity so here i said adjacency matrix but we can calculate adjacency matrix in this way also in this way saying that the similarity of embeddings in the input space should be similar to the similarity of embeddings in the latent space very similar to the idea of what maximum mean discrepance sorry multidimensional scaling very similar to the idea of multidimensional scaling multidimensional scaling one of its variants minimizes the difference of similarities of points in the input space and embedding space for more information see my mds lecture in the statistical machine learning course so here as i said minimize we minimize the mean squared error between a and a hat where a and a hat are the similarities of the embeddings in the input and latent space respectively and f here is the frobenius norm the optimization variable is the weights of both uh, layers of encoder. Interestingly, there is no decoder. There is dec the decoder is kind of calculating a hat. There is no weight for a decoder. De the decoder's job is only calculating a hat, as we saw in this equation. For a to 43, right? Interesting. Now, graph variational autoencoder. So its idea is very similar to what we have in var variational autoencoder in fu fully connected network. So the first layer, so now I have again two layers, two layers for one of the parameters, so I, now I assume the latent variable has some distribution, right? As the distribution can have several parameters. For every parameter, I use two layers, where the first layer between all of the parameters is shared. Assume it is Gaussian distribution, right? Therefore, I have two parameters of the distribution, mu and sigma, mean and variance, right? If it is multi-dimensional Gaussian distribution, I can assume the covariance matrix is diagonal. Therefore, sigma is also becomes a vector. Then what happens? I have theta one, theta two, and theta three, where theta one is shared between the parameters. I have theta two, I have theta three. Of course, theta one and theta two, you can see it as what we had before for two layer of graph in our network. Theta one and theta three also, you can see it as a two layer graph neural network, right? So using these, I can generate some mu and sigma. Then it defines my latent space, the distribution of latent space. Now I can sample from this latent space as we had in variational autoencoder in regular networks. Then it gives me again zi and zj, right? Zi, zi and zj. Why? How can I calculate zi and zj? So I feed xi to theta 1 and theta 2. It gives me mu to theta 1 and theta 3. It gives me sigma. It gives me some uh, no normal vector, normal distribution with mu and sigma. I sample from it. It gives me zi. I do this for xj again i feed it to the network theta one and theta two gives me some mu theta one and theta three gives me some sigma it gives me some n mu sigma by the way this mu and sigma might, might differ right because xi and xj are different i sample from this distribution it gives me zj now i can calculate a between a similarity between z and zj as before a hat so now I can calculate A. There are some more things in this graph variational autoencoder. What is that? The latent variables of the nodes are independent, right? Therefore, the encoder of graph variational autoencoder models this conditional distribution. 
Q of Z I given X and A. The probability of Z given X and adjacency matrix. And why can I multiply them? Because they are independent. This give, gives me Q of Z given X and A. And Z again is the latent variables, N by P. As I said, you can see this as a norm uh, Gaussian distribution, for example, with, uh, with what? Mu, uh, mean mu i and diagonal covariance matrix with these uh, uh, variances. As I said, I sample from these. Once it gives me, I sample z i from q of z i given x and a and z j from q of z j given x and a, right? We calculated this q. So by q, I mean, you feed x i to the network, it gives you some mu i sigma i. It gives you q of z i given x. You, once you feed x j to the network, it gives you mu j and sigma j. You, can, you sample from that distribution, right? It gives you q of z j given x and a. You sample from them. We can define q of a given z as this. Probability of a i j given z i and z j. I have two double multiplication. Why? Again, because they are independent of each other. Then I calculate the a again. The a again. I calculate the a again that I had. Do you agree? So sim in simple words, in simple words, I feed x i to theta 1 and theta 2. It gives me mu i. I feed x i to theta 1 and theta 3. It gives me mu sigma i. I I uh, have the distribution of the Gaussian distribution of mu i and sigma i. I sample from it, it gives me z i. I do the same for x j. I will have distribution uh, of Gaussian distribution of mu j and sigma j. I sample from it, it gives me z j. I have some z i, some z j. I can calculate a matrix a using the uh, sigmoid function that we had using this equation, this A should, be, should match with the previous A, right? But we use a lot, we don't use mean squared error loss function anymore. Here, we use evidence lower bound as we had in variational autoencoder, elbow. What was elbow? This was exactly the formulation of elbow that we saw several lectures ago, where this is scale divergence, right? What does it do? When we max, we want to maximize this, right? We want to maximize the evidence lower bound in variational autoencoder. When you maximize this mi minus scale divergence, see the second term. It means that you are minimizing this scale divergence. And what is this scale divergence? It's saying that make the, the posterior of Z given X and A similar to what I want as a prior of Z, right? At the same time, I want to maximize this. What is this? The logarithm of likelihood of A given Z. I want to maximize the likelihood of A given Z. So I, I want A to be very similar, it's likely to what we had before. But at the same time, I want the distribution in the latent space to be similar to the, my prior distribution, desired distribution. But here we, are, we should maximize this elbow. In neural network, you usually minimize that. Therefore, we minimize minus of this. So we minimize minus of this, right? Using backpropagation. It's very interesting. The some slides of this slide deck is inspired by the teachings of Professor Ali Gotzi at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and graph neural network in PyTorch geometric. PyTorch geometric is the library in PyTorch for graph neural networks. We can see that it's very good. Also, there is a good tutorial on PyTorch geometric in YouTube by Antonio Longa. Uh, take a look at this playlist and I think it's very good. These are the references. Let me 
uh, go to the next topic and try I try to be fast in this one mm, and that's where was it okay now let's distillation so do you remember I said uh, and we have when we have uh, network we can compress it to become smaller right when is it useful especially for embedded systems for embedded systems you can't uh, it, its memory doesn't allow you to have the whole neural network you need to make a smaller version of that uh, especially for birds gpt they have made a smaller such as tiny birds a small bird they have made smaller versions of birds in um, in phones for example as embedded systems so one of the methods for network compression is knowledge distillation. Knowledge distillation or KD, it was proposed in 2015. It, it is used for network compression. The large neural network is called teacher network. The main neural network that we have is called the teacher network. The smaller version of the neural network that is the compressed network is called a student network, okay? The student network tries to mimic the behavior of the teacher network. So teacher tries to teach the uh, student. Therefore, it can be considered as the compressed version of the large teacher network. Assume the teacher network is already trained on some training data. Assume it is BERT, for example, trained on the internet. The student network is trained by minimizing this last function. So what is this? By the way, sorry, this should be KD. This is KL, I apologize. Yes. A lo loss of KD or knowledge distillation is this. One minus lambda LCE. LCE is a cross entropy loss. And LKL is the KL divergence loss, okay? You find in equations two and three. So first off, this is a linear combination of these two losses where lambda is some parameter, right? And LCE, what is this? This is cross entropy between the target labels and my, the output of the student. What is this? FSX is the output of a student network for the input X. What is sigma FSX? It means I have a sigmoid activation function at the end, okay? So it gives me some label between zero and one, and I want it to be similar to the target label. Therefore, I use cross entropy. What is the Kale divergence loss? It calculates the Kale divergence between the output of a student FSX and the output of teacher. FTX. Why am I have by by the way, tau here is the parameter, some parameter. We call it temperature. Okay. So basically, what is two, equation two and what is equation three? Equation two tries that a student learns from targets. Target labels. In equation three, a student learns from a teacher. So in, in equation three, a student mimics the teacher. In equation two, a student learns the target labels. These are called hard labels. These are called soft labels. So I think the idea is very simple, right? Now you have a linear combination of these two lusts and you minimize it. So at the same time that I'm learning hard labels, I try to mimic the teacher. And these are the cross entropy and K divergence, right? By definition of cross entropy and K divergence. We can have annealing in knowledge distillation. So how? We can have two stages, stage one and stage two. Stage one, we can gradually mimic the teacher in the student learning the soft labels. In stage two, we can learn the hard labels. 
So rather than having them at the same time, we can do it in a stage wise, not at the same time. In stage one, I have uh, KL, sorry, KL loss. In a stage, sorry, yeah, KD loss. Why do I call it KD? Because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's having the idea of distilling knowledge from teacher to student, okay? Or the idea of mimicking, soft labels. So here, this is soft labels. Here again, it is hard labels in a stage two. So rather than having a linear combination of the loss functions, I have stage one and stage two. Also, I can replace the KL divergence that I had by mean squared error. I can do that, right? They have used that. And interestingly here, take a look at this. What is this? They are multiplying the output of the teacher by some this the annealing function, where this function, uh, tau, uh, by the way, tau i is the iteration index from one to tau max, and tau max is where we stop stage one and go to stage two, right? So for several initial iterations, we, we try to mimic the teacher, and then we use the hard labels only. And what is the equation eight? It is a decreasing function, right? It is a decrease because when tau i is one, it is one. Then it gradually goes to zero. It is a decreasing function from one to zero. What does it mean? Initially, mimic the teacher a lot. Initially, the student knows nothing. Mimic the teacher a lot. Then anneal it. Gradually, don't learn from the teacher. Learn, it, learn initially very hard. Then close to the end of the semester, forget the teacher, <laughs> okay? Assume tau max is the end of the semester. After the sem end of the semester, forget the teacher completely and learn from the uh, target labels or from the book. <laughs> I think that's a good example. <laughs> semester, learn from teacher, then forget teacher. Then in a stage two, after semester, learn from books, right? Uh, we have other variants of knowledge distillation, just a list of them. One problem with KD is the size of the teacher, if the size of teacher and student nets differ significantly, if the teacher is very big, the network is too small, there is a problem. It doesn't learn well. That's called the gap problem. Gap problem. So we can have intermediate networks. We call them teacher assistant network. <laughs> Therefore, teacher assistant can learn from teacher. And then, so teacher assistant mimics the teacher. The student mimics the teacher assistant. The size of teacher assistant is between the size of teacher and student. We can have a hierarchy of TAs, a bigger TA, a smaller TA, smaller TA until we have a very small student, okay? And it was proposed in 2020. So far, we also assumed that the teacher network is fully trained and this, then the student network is trained. Alternatively, we can train both the teacher and student simultaneously proposed in 2021, very, now it is 2023, two years ago, where KD loss is used for both, right? So what does it mean? A student learns from teacher, teachers learns from a student. Collaboratively, they learn from each other. In this way, teacher also learns from student. This is actually true in real life too. Teacher also learns from student, right? One problem with KD is that it has been empirically found out that not necessarily the last iteration of the teacher is the best for training the student network. Assume you train a teacher, it is trained. Now we wanna start training the student, but the last iteration is not necessarily the best 
for for training the student. That's called. Therefore, you need to search between the checkpoints of the teacher, which one is better for the student. That's called the problem of checkpoint search in KD. Alternatively, for solving this issue, we can have two stages where we train the teacher and the student together again simultaneously. So learning them simultaneously lets the student find out which checkpoint is better for it. Right. We can also we can mimic the output of every layer of teacher for the student. What does it? What do I mean? Of course, the teacher and the student differ, at least in size, right? Maybe even in the network structure, they might differ, okay? Either in size or network structure or both, right? They, are, they, diff they differ. Okay, how can I distill knowledge from different layers of teacher to layers of student? I think the simplest idea is that let's have a linear combination of them. When you hear linear combination, you should think of attention, attention mechanism. So we can have attention for uh, KD, right? We can have, you can distill using this and that's attention weights. We learn the attention weights by back propagation. Proposed in 2021 and many other variants. A survey on KD is reference seven. Here is here are the references. Okay, this course is over. Uh, we couldn't cover some things, but we tried to cover most important things. Uh, and the next session is the presentation. Uh, please come and present. Uh, before we end the session, how is it? Is it good? Any feedback? I said that well, it's a very personal favorite subject of mine, so I think it was really good to, to know better all the models they are, and at least the most important of them. And also because I could see some other patients different from the ones I usually do in the, my research. Okay. It's really good. That's great. Thanks. What about you? Oh. It was great. Like, what happens with the uh complex subject is that uh, teachers see the students are not learning and they slow down so they cannot cover more complex topics so like uh, mm -hmm. this one uh, you cover everything you promise <laughs> okay yeah none of none of the topics are the same. thank you yes. okay great i'm happy that you liked it. thank you okay thanks, thanks.